And first up, we have Professor Jason Potts, and we were just discussing briefly there. I asked him how long it's been since he was a communist, and he said it's, it's coming up to nearly 20 years now, so he's, that means he's about 19 years ahead of Brendan still, but we'll get to that later. Uh, but anyway, Jason is a professor of economics at RMIT, and he is uh, one of the senior economists in this country that believes in freedom, which means of all five that are still left in academia, he's the one of the most senior of them. Uh, but anyway, please make Jason feel welcome to the stage. All right, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do is I'll, I'll sort of introduce our team just very quickly. But you've, um, I, I like this protocol of, of you've all got the introductions in, in, in your thing. So we've got, um, we've got Darcy Allen, IPA, PhD student. Um, we've got Brendan Markey Teller from UQ who will talk to us about artificial intelligence. And um, we've got Naomi Brockwell, who you've, you've already heard from um, already, and but what we haven't heard from is we're talking about Bitcoin and blockchain. So she'll be presenting, discussing that, and then we'll get through this and then open things up for, for discussion. Um, look, so this session's around on innovation and technology, and you know, everyone likes talking about that, but what we want to focus on is why is innovation and technology an issue for libertarians or classical liberals or whatever we're, however we're self-identifying now. Because it's not obvious that it is, right? It's just, it's just a thing that's in the world and um, we want to sort of think about why this, why technology and technology policy is, is, a, is a concern for, for libertarians. Um, Speaking to the mic, Jason. All right. The, so the, the basic issue here is, is that um, for economists and for policy, the reason that technology and innovation policy is an issue is, is this basic argument that innovation and technology causes economic growth. And that's a good thing, because economic growth causes increases in GDP, and that's a good thing. Because increases in GDP increases tax revenue, because, and that's the, the reason that we can then think about the significance of government having an issue, um, being involved in this. And what the sort of standard argument is, is, is that we want more of these good things, we want more innovation and technology and, 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 and so on, um, because we want more wealth and prosperity and happiness and, and all of the things that that brings. And there's three buts in this story. And the first but is we want more innovation and technology because of all of the good things that brings, but market failure. And that's the beginning of, of, of the reason that this is a libertarian issue. Um, the standard sort of economic argument that gives us such things as public universities and the CSIRO um, and R&D tax policy and industry policy and not millions, not billions, but kind of trillions of dollars that are spent globally um, as government transfers in this story is a, an economic argument around government, I mean, around market failure. It just says, for many things, most things you can leave to the free competitive markets except the things that are public goods. And one of the key sort of maneuvers that takes place is this idea that innovation and new technology are public goods, that they experience market failure. And that's the, the thin edge of the wedge and, um, that we need to sort of think through. Because once you've diagnosed something as being a public good subject to market failure, what you've effectively said is that Competitive free markets can't deliver this thing in the ef efficient quantities that you want, right? And now we've got a concern. So what do you do? Well, that, that then gives we need government policy to fix that market failure problem, right? So um, that's kind of the standard, largely un still unquestioned argument um, that I think we don't pay enough attention to this. Um, so this is the, of course we like innovation, of course we like new technology, of course we need government to do something about it. That doesn't follow. And I want to explain why. Um, so the, the argument here is, 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 so that's the first but, but market failure. The second but is, um, but if there wasn't government involvement in this, providing R&D tax subsidies and public universities and backing intellectual property, and, and that's a complex story, but, um, there would be no technology and therefore no growth, and therefore we wouldn't get the thing that we want, which is um, economic performance. Um, again, that's just empirically nonsense. Um, it's, it's one of these things that, that looks and feels right when you focus on the charismatic mega technologies. Right? So if we look at sort of 
nuclear power or, or things that involve very large public investments that look like monopoly, natural monopolies, or I mean, the latest one is, is solar technology. Um, you know, we want more of that, um, more of that is good, therefore market failure, not, there's not enough investment, there's not enough private investment in these things. And that's the diagnosis that gets made. If, if there's a lack of private investment in the thing that we want that was seen to be good for society, the, the diagnosis becomes that's therefore market failure, therefore government subsidy transfer to correct this, this, this thing. Um, what often doesn't happen is the focus on, well, if, if you buy that argument, what about software? Um, there's whole other sectors that are doing perfectly well, enormously high-tech sectors that have not been subject to these, 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 these private investment failures. Um, so you know, we, we can start making lists and compare, well, you know, there's, there's, there's other there's counterexamples on that. Um, but th the point I want to make here is, is that the way that this argument is set up is it looks like there's an investment problem in developing new technology. And that's the market failure of the private investment. If we solve that, we get the new technology and, and, the, and the future. Um, the argument that I'm going to represent and will be echoed down this, this line is that private or investment isn't the issue. What is the issue is discovery of value. Um, it's entrepreneurial discovery of value is really the issue with new technologies. It's not private investment to who will pay for my research laboratory. It's how do we discover what people want? Right? That's, the, that's the economic problem. It's an entrepreneurial problem. It's not, a private, it's not an investment problem. It's an entrepreneurial market discovery problem. And this is the beginning of, sort of re-diagnosing the economics of new technology is that it's not a transfer of resources, there's not enough investment going in this thing, and we can you know, shift it around through taxation to get it to where it needs to go so we can have the future. What the issue is, is how do we create institutional, the institutions that we need in order to discover the value, the, um, the, the um, value of new technologies so we can put them to use, and that's the source of, of economic growth. So, that's, that's the second but is, is, is that if um, no government, then no technology, nonsense. The third but is, in order to solve this economic problem of new technology and innovation, um, we have to be able to try new things. We have to be able to do things that haven't been done before. We have to do things that might impinge upon what is already being done in unknown ways, right? And that sort of discovery aspect is, is the, I think, the core, the core of this issue of, 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 of the, the libertarian, classical liberal perspective on, on technology and innovation is, um, as Mike Munger mentioned yesterday, it's about permissionless innovation. It's about, we don't need, I mean, the requirement to permission innovation, the requirement to permission doing of new things is the main barrier to new technology and innovation. And it's the diagnosis, the issue here is it's not, if only we had enough investment, we would lead the world in developing new technology and countries that can invest a lot will, will, will win. Um, what the real issue here is it's countries that are free to experiment will have new technologies and societies that will develop these um, innovation and new technology. And that's the issue. The issue is, is not investment, the issue is permissioning. Um, so that's the sort of the, the thing I want to sort of think through. And the, so that's what we mean by this notion of, of, of permissionless innovation, that the real innovation policy is not the transfer of funds from one group of people to another group of people to do the thing. The real issue is about deregulation of existing things to enable experimentation to take place, to enable a, a, an institutional environment that is basically safe for entrepreneurship. So that's, that's essentially the, the argument that we represent in terms of what is the, the economics of, of innovation new technology here. Um, just a few just quick things that, that what this looks like, what permissionless innovation looks like. I mean, this, this argument was set out by Adam um, Thiera at um, George Mason, you know, at Mercatus Center, I think, um, put this together. But it's, it's kind of become a, become a thing that we want to focus on. Um, a lot of stuff that you wouldn't think of as innovation and technology policy or innovation and technology issues are. First one is occupational licensing. Um, licensing that locks down the definition of a, of a, of a job um, or a career or of a, 
of a service is effectively anti-technology innovation, I mean, anti-technology regulation. Um, health and safety regulations that are designed to prohibit bad things from happening have the unintended consequence of prohibiting experimentation. A lot of health and safety type regulations and this need, um, the precautionary principle as, as a test case, are basically anti-technology regulation, anti-technology policy and anti-innovation policy. Um, so these are the, the way of thinking about this is in terms of the enemies of innovation. Um, not so much what can we do to promote innovation and new technologies, but what can we do to um, wind, to basically reduce the amount of um, impediments to, experiment, to entrepreneurial experimentation and discovery of value. So you know, companies like Uber and Airbnb, we're all familiar with the problems that they're going through. It's not just them, this is a general problem that exists for all new technologies. All right, so um, I'll end with just a, a, a thought. Um, I mean, what this then means is that this really is the fight and the, the, the policy issue that we should be thinking about is basically deregulation as innovation policy rather than public spending as innovation policy. And the sort of historical consequence of this is that um, free societies have always been technologically advanced societies. And that's not and has never been because those free societies have awesome um, innovation policies. And uh, I mean, explicitly, it's not because they have great universities. It's not because they have great sci um, CSIRO type departments. Those are things you can buy with a wealthy, rich economy. Free societies have always been technologically advanced, um, in essence, because they are less resistant to new ideas. And that's the policy reframing that I think needs to take place at a much more fundamental level. It's, um, it's not about spending priorities, it's about deregulation and enabling um, increasing use of the court systems to sort of deal with harms after the event. Um, it's around sunset clauses being built in. It's about sort of essentially what is a moral and cultural perspective on um, being tolerant and um, having forbearance to just wait and see what the consequences of something new will be before we try and shut it down and regulate it. So with that, I'll hand it over to Darcy, who will talk about... Very similar things. Very similar things, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Today I'm going to speak about innovation policy as well, and I'm going to echo a lot of the things that Jason has already said. In particular, though, I want to talk about some acknowledgements that we must make if we want to move towards a more classically liberal approach to innovation policy. If we're still going to be talking about innovation policy in the public debate, then what should we be arguing for? And what I want to argue is that it should be based on entrepreneurs and knowledge rather than allocation and redistribution of money. That's what it currently is. Now, classically liberals have, classical liberals have long been sceptical of market failures. This isn't because we believe markets are perfect, however. It's because we believe that market failures are often the penultimate step to technocracy and planning. Market failures are used in the spectacular leap between something that looks imperfect in the world to a contrived image of how government can fix and engineer away that problem. And what is true about market failures generally is equally true about market failures of modern innovation policy. No, mu no matter how much we like innovation. So to be clear, arguing against innovation policy and its foundations at the moment is not to argue against innovation itself. It's just to understand that individual entrepreneurs were innovating long before we had R&D tax credits. Indeed, innovation is a marvellous phenomenon. It transforms our lives and makes us flourish. This is the centre of what sort of a libertarian philosophy, a free market philosophy is about. It's about the entrepreneur. But this is what makes innovation almost unmatched in its political marketability. This is why innovation policy is also extremely dangerous. It quickly morphs into the supposedly agile but certainly very expensive suite of interve interventions that we saw today and in the previous election campaign. So given that today's innovation policy costs us billions of dollars, how can we move towards a more classically liberal approach? We must acknowledge several aspects about innovation. The first one is that innovation is done by entrepreneurs. It's about entrepreneurship. 
Second, that entrepreneurship requires more than money. And third, that entrepreneurship happens in civil society as people interact with each other. And once we reframe innovation policy around these foundations, we will move towards a more classically liberal approach. So the first acknowledgement is that any discussion of innovation, as with any discussion of economics more broadly, must always begin from the choosing and the acting individual person. For innovation, that is the entrepreneur. We need to understand what problems the entrepreneur faces. Entrepreneurs, as Jason mentioned, must discover the valuable uses for new technologies that meet human need. That is what they do. This means entrepreneurs must observe market signals. They must observe prices and what consumers want through non-price signals. They must make judgments and calculations about opportunities to exploit and to make profits. But if we think about modern innovation policy, it is grounded in the idea that firms innovate or that governments innovate, but we won't go down that story. We must remember that firms are made of people too. The danger in talking about firms is that it obscures the entrepreneur. We start to talk about investment and we lose sight of the fundamental problem that the entrepreneur faces. At the beginning of new technologies, what we see, and we can expand on this in question time, are entrepreneurs that come together and share their information about market opportunities. As Naomi will be talking about Bitcoin and blockchain, if we look at that industry right now, there are an extreme number of conferences, hackathons, and collaborative things between different people in the industry. These are entrepreneurs operating outside the boundaries of firms, and quite often they're entrepreneurs acting before they perceive their own firm. For example, much of my work is in hackerspaces and amateur groups that emerge around other new technologies, such as 3D printing, for instance. What this should tell us is that entrepreneurship is a complex and it is a messy process. It happens not just in firms, big or small, but it happens in civil society itself, and it happens as entrepreneurs interact with each other. This leads me to the second acknowledgement. Innovation policy must acknowledge that entrepreneurship requires more than money. Modern innovation policy acts, as Jason has mentioned, as if the fundamental problem is a problem of lack of private resources, of people spending money on innovation. Following this logic gets us to modern innovation policy. The role of government is to then redistribute resources. They do this in many means, and this is what they effectively all of innovation policy is about. They hand out monopoly protection, such as intellectual property. There's tax cuts specifically for spending money on innovation, or the direct funding and provision of public science. But the entrepreneurial problem is the discovery of valuable uses for new technologies. This is a knowledge problem. It is not an allocation problem. Entrepreneurs must govern and interpret dispersed information. This is, of course, what the great Friedrich Hayek taught us should be the centre of economics, and it still should also be the forefront of innovation policy. So, what we know about innovation is this. Innovation is propelled by entrepreneurs. They observe and make judgments about what they see, and they do this in a wide range of governance mechanisms, outside of firms and outside of governments. So, what then does good innovation policy look like? Well, good, in good innovation policy looks a lot like good economic policy. It certainly does not look like the continual redistribution and rent seeking that characterises innovation policy we see today. We need to shift the foundations of innovation policy so that it is not first about redistributing money from some parts of the economy to others. Rather, government should begin by tearing down the barriers that prevent entrepreneurs not just from experimenting, but from organising with others and discovering opportunities. This means deregulation. It means cutting red tape. Institute of Public Affairs research has shown that red tape costs Australia $176 billion every year in foregone economic output. Some of that is because regulation hamp hampers entrepreneurs. Some of that regulation is created and maintained by government and the incumbents that lobby them. This is clear with the now cliched examples of Uber and Airbnb. 
But if we acknowledge the entrepreneur, other regulations on the chopping block under the banner of innovation policy are much, much broader. Zoning laws. Zoning laws prevent quasi-commercial operations, such as hackerspaces, from emerging. Jason has mentioned occupational licensing, which prevents people from entering professions, and in particular on the boundaries of different professions. And more generally, innovation policy should be concerned with any government dictates that increase the complexity of writing contracts and exchanging with others. These all prevent entrepreneurs from acting entrepreneurially, or more broadly, they prevent individuals from voluntarily exchanging with others. Finally, innovation policy must recognise the importance of signals. If we take it that the role of the entrepreneur is to observe what they see in markets and to fulfil human exchange and to fulfil human need, then we must recognise how important those signals are. Excessive government intervention distorts those signals, even when they are made in the best of intentions. So in closing, what this means is that the heart of good innovation policy are the institutional systems we know create well-functioning markets. That is, good economic policy of smaller government, fewer distortions, of strong rule of law, and of course, freedom. Thank you. So, next up we have my fellow PhD student at UQ. Uh, although he actually did his on time, it showed uh, what it's supposed to be done like. Please welcome Brendan Markitala. Uh, what John neglected to mention there was that uh, he's been responsible for bringing me to the Liberty Movement, and so we m might as well dedicate this talk to you, John, because this is a bit more, uh, it's very touching. It's about uh, sort of the practicalities of Liberty. These chaps have talked uh, about how innovation policy works, and I want to talk a little bit to why it is absolutely critical that we get uh, serious about innovation policy right now. Uh, and the argument that I'm going to try and make is that from the perspective of liberty, we need to be becoming entrepreneurs. We need to become entrepreneurs to defend our liberty in a world of constantly changing technology. We need to be entrepreneurs to keep ahead of the curve and not have to uh, rely on the government or other individuals who may coerce us, uh, impede on our liberty. We need to become entrepreneurs to avoid that situation. Now, to do that, I want to talk about the limiting case of technology. At the moment in the world, if you pay any attention to the tech world, you'll be seeing this talk that the robots are coming, the robots are coming, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. This is the limiting case of technology, and it's very interesting to see what the economics of that technology are and what that means from the perspective of maintaining liberty in society. So, what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is... By definition, it's an artificial intelligence. It's, by definition, the recreation of a human mind on a machine. It's the recreation of a human mind on a machine. That is to say, we can take the structure of how a mind works and we can put it into a physical process. That's a calculator, essentially. Even a calculator is an artificial intelligence after a fashion. Uh, and uh, even after the first invention of, of the very first computers, Alan Turing was already saying, look, these things are basically recreating minds on machines. The big boost to AI and why this is such a mother of God technology is the advent of machine learning. Because not only can we program now how minds work into machines, we can get those minds to evolve. They can learn. They can update. That's really important because this is a qualitatively different technology to anything that went before. Technologies in the past have really just extended the realm of human capability. They've just, uh, instead of having to go and attack John with a machete, I can shoot him from five feet away. It's extending at what I can do. This is different. This is a substitute for human labour. It's a substitute for human labour. It is not a mere complement. It can do what a human being can do, and that's critical to understand, except in one particular. There is one thing that we don't know a machine can do, and it's, there's one thing that differentiates a human from a machine, and that is consciousness. 
And consciousness, we can make a philosophical argument, allows us to be creative. And creative doesn't just mean that you become an artist uh, or, or a scientist. Creative is also the, the exercising of judgment. So those are two things that we do not know a machine can do. Um, and that's going to be really important because the second that we do create a, a, a machine that has consciousness, I am retreating to the Great Dividing Range with some rifles and supplies. Uh, so that's what an AI can do, that's what it can't do. It is a substitute for all routine routine human labour, except in that particular of consciousness, except in that particular that we can't get a machine to be creative or exercise judgement yet. Now, what's the economics of that? And this is where we start to see why technology is a threat to liberty, uh, but, well, not just a threat, we can get ahead of it and we can, uh, we can maintain our liberty and get all the, we can have our cake and eat it too, we can get the advantages uh, of, of, of technology without losing our liberty, but there is a threat to liberty from this technology and it emerges as soon as we chuck it into a model of an economy. So if we chuck that artificial intelligence into a model of the economy, what it spits out is three really profoundly disturbing um, predictions. First of all, there is no future for routine labour. If an artificial intelligence can do exactly what a human labourer can do, there's no need for the human labourer. The machine can do it cheaper and better. So there's no future for routine labour with this artificial intelligence technology that is coming along. We also have insane production technology. This is a Star Trek type uh, production technology. You remember in Star Trek, if you all are fans of that, um, that you just go to a replicator on the wall and you say, give me some Earl Grey tea. And it, the machine just produces it for you immediately. That's the sort of production technology that we are going towards. This is a massive, what economists like to call, a massive scaling technology. We can produce thousands of widgets, all one with the same amount of effort on the part of a human labor. And that's important because this is likely to generate an insanely unequal distribution of income. If you can scale your production technology, that creates a winner-take-all environment in markets where if I've got the best product, if I've created the best product, I win the entire market. So those are three big concerns that come from, uh, from a model of the economy from a perspective of maintaining liberty. Liberty is not just coercion from others using force. It's the ability to live your life as you see fit. Now, if you've got artificial intelligence coming along like this, the, those three predictions of the models of, of, of economics about how this uh, plays out directly impact on that liberty. You don't have an ability to get income from routine labour. You can't use that income to buy the material goods and services necessary for your life. That's really, really, really disturbing right, from the perspective of maintaining liberty. There is a way to deal with it though, and that's where this idea that we all need to become entrepreneurs comes from, and we need to get serious about innovation policy comes from, because there is that one thing that we don't know machines can do yet, and that's the ability to be creative and to exercise judgment. If we want to maintain our liberty to live our lives as we see fit in this world of artificial intelligence, and that's just one technology, this is all uh, technologies have this sort of effect. If we want to maintain our liberty to live as we see fit, we need to become entrepreneurs. We need to do what that technology cannot do so that we can obtain income and so that we can live our lives as we see fit. Now, what does that require? This is where we get into the practicalities. And uh, luckily, this doesn't require the government for us to do. We can do it ourselves. We can become creative and exercise judgment ourselves and maintain our liberty in the face of artificial intelligence technology. The most basic thing that all y'all sitting here can do is to develop generalised knowledge because the problem of being creative isn't exactly how do I become creative and genuinely creative? How do I come up with something that I wasn't told to come up with? That, that's actually not so much of a problem, really. We are all creative. One guy up the back going, I'm not. But we are all of us creative. You are all individuals. We're all creative. The problem is not coming up with new ideas. It's acting on them. It's accepting the idea, incorporating it into your mind. That's the problem of uh, encouraging creativity and judgment. We need to be able to get people to act on their ideas. And for that, there's some very nice mathematics which you can read. Um, check out my website. Which says the way that you get this is to develop generalised knowledge. 
contra specialized knowledge. This is to say, learn a little of everything. Because learning a little of everything allows you to see connections, to accept connections in a way that you didn't before. Uh, having generalized knowledge means that new ideas don't contradict your mindset. They only build at the periphery of, of cores that are already in your mind. And that allows you to incorporate ideas much more easily. That allows you to be creative. That allows you to exercise judgment and maintain your liberty, to, see your, to live your life as you see fit, even in the face of a mother of God technology like artificial intelligence. So that's what you can do. After this presentation, go home, well, actually, no, after this conference, go home, read a book, go to an art gallery, learn a little art theory, learn a little history, learn classics, learn a new language, learn mathematics and science, learn about birds, I think Arvins was talking about uh, yesterday. Learn about birds. These are things that develop your general knowledge and allow you to maintain your liberty in a world of constantly changing technology by becoming an entrepreneur, being able to be creative and to, be, uh, to exercise judgment. Um, and so I was really impressed with, that, with the homeschooling uh, talk yesterday with that idea that Get your kids on board early with this. Generate, uh, learn general knowledge so that you can exercise uh, judgment and be creative. Teach your kids. Encourage them to seek out new sorts of information that they wouldn't have otherwise uh, sought in school. School creates a fairly rigid, you know, specialised knowledge. We train you up to be a certain thing. Don't do that. That's not how you maintain your liberty in a world going forward. So that's what you can do as an individual. But we also, and this ties into the overall themes of this conference, we need, uh, permission, we, we need permissionless information because we can have these ideas, we can exercise judgment, we can uh, be creative, but we have to not be stopped from doing that. And that's why this permissionless, this permissionless innovation idea, this idea of freeing up our societies so that we don't just stop, we don't just discourage people and let people be innovative, we encourage them to be innovative. We need to be getting serious about that right now, not just from the old communist bugbear of maintaining life, liberty and happiness. We need to do this from the perspective of liberty so that people have the freedom to live their lives as they see fit. And to finish up, um, one other way to do this, of course, and I'd like to thank John for bringing up this and making uh, it clear that it's not entirely communist, is uh, the bringing back of friendly societies. These are the sorts of things that we need to be getting serious about. Uh, yesterday in order to maintain our liberty in a AI world, in a world of constantly changing technologies, we all need to become entrepreneurs and we need to get serious about innovation policy yesterday. Thank you. All right, now we have Naomi Brockwell, who's got the best CV ever. Um, and I've got the worst microphone ever. Um, the ones that won't be captured on camera anyway. That microphone's the only one captured on camera, so please talk into it. Hold on. Okie dokie. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin and blockchain technology. It was interesting, this morning I was in the elevator at the hotel and the guy read my badge and said, oh, Liberty Conference, what's that? And I said, oh, it's this thing going around, on around the corner, you should check it out. And he said, oh, you're a speaker. I said, oh, yeah, I'm speaking. He said, what are you going to talk about? I said, Bitcoin. And he said, Oh, yes, Bitcoin. Yeah, we don't really need that. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay. He said, mm, it's a bit iffy. And for me, that sort of sums up most people's reaction to this technology. And it's interesting in, in Australia, I've been trying to interview people who are in the space, who are part of Bitcoin startups or blockchain startups, and, um, and haven't been able to find many people. And that's really interesting to me as well, that not many people in Australia are are interested in this. Like how many in the room actually own Bitcoin? So yeah, I mean, this is probably the, all the people in Australia who do. You're all at this conference. Um, it, but it makes a lot of sense that people in Australia might not be too interested in it. Uh, it, it it's the same in, in America, although there are a lot more people in America, so there tend to be a lot more people interested in it. But like per capita, I mean, we live in a safe country. We live in a pretty good country. And uh, the government, I mean, for all its faults, is better than a lot of other governments out there. So Bitcoin really, if you think about it, is useful 
for a lot of different things. One of the main things is the black market. Right? So the, a lot of the people I've talked to was like, oh, I know someone you could interview about Bitcoin. He buys a lot of drugs with it. I'm like, oh, all right. Um, and that's, that's the same in America. People buy a lot of drugs with Bitcoin. It's used on the black market. But you see, the black market in Australia is drugs, right? The black market in China is your groceries and your basic clothing and basic medical supplies that you need to survive. And that's where Bitcoin becomes very useful. Um, and so, I mean, I wanted to give a, a real world example of, of somewhere in the world that Bitcoin is really changing lives. Like Australians, I mean, we are lucky here. We are lucky. And it, and it is hard to wrap our head around why we would need this digital form of currency, this uh, form of currency that is instantaneous, is global, is all kinds of wonderful things. But, you know, our, our credit card works just as well. And our fiat money, dirty fiat, uh, works just as well. Um, but look at, look at Venezuela, for example. So all kind of stuff, bad stuff is going on there right now. And you have children who are just fainting from starvation in, in classrooms. They're so hungry, they're just fainting. And you have people who can't get groceries and they're lining up for 72 hours to get to the front of the line and discover that, that all of the flour is gone and that's all that was on offer anyway. And I mean, that's not a way to live. And this is destroying lives over there because government has put in these really abhorrent policies um, that just make it really hard for people to live. So what people are actually doing, and it's interesting, um, let me backtrack a little bit. So when you're mining Bitcoin, it's not generally profitable because you use a lot of electricity to do it. It's a lot of computing power. And, um, and in Venezuela, they've actually put price fixes on the, on the cost of electricity. So these people are mining Bitcoin over there at the cost of basically zero. So it's like having a printing press in their basement, right? It's actually really interesting. So what they're doing in Venezuela is, is people in secret, of course, are mining Bitcoin and they're using Bitcoin because it's an international currency to buy from Amazon, to buy from Walmart. They're having these things shipped to docks in Miami and then um, sent across the across the ocean and they're, they're paying people who know all of the correct routes to take, all the correct people to bribe to get it into Venezuela. And that's how they're feeding their communities. And that's incredible. You know, I mean, th when, when people tell me like, why do we need Bitcoin? I, my answer is, yeah, you probably don't. Uh, but people in other countries that aren't so fortunate, they do. And, you know, just be careful because countries can fall. You just need a, a bad person to come into power and, and to start you know, seizing a lot of the power. And it's so, you know, it's frightening how quickly freedom can disappear. And you see that all around the world. So um, I, I'm really interested in, in Bitcoin. I, uh, I've worked for lots of different Bitcoin startups in lots of different capacities. But for me, it's the fact that it gives power, financial power back to the people. And I think that's huge because, you know, whoever controls the money supply has all of the power, right? And first of all, I mean, there's been a, a government monopoly on the money supply for a really long time. And whenever you have a government monopoly on anything, there's just no innovation in there. And what you have is the private sector's come up and uh, someone called Satoshi Nakamoto, we don't know who that person is or that group of people is, um, he came up with this money that he specifically engineered to be the ideal form of money. And it's wonderful, you know, it's global, it's money of the internet. We live in a digital age and it's digital cash. We live in an internet age and this is money of the internet. It's really quite, quite wonderful. And also we're living more and more in a global marketplace as well. So to have a global currency, especially I, I, don't, I don't live in Australia anymore, and for me to transfer money back and forth, you know, transfer savings, the amount of fees and the rigmarole that it goes through, and then you know, the banks charge me whatever exchange rate they decide is best at the time, I lose 4% just from, just from the exchange rate that they've chosen. Like it is, it is really difficult. So to have money that's, that's uh, universal across the world is, is really, really interesting. Um, it's not just Bitcoin that's that's interesting. Like, who here is hasn't got Bitcoin but is interested in looking into it? Like, what have been the main barriers to you getting into it? Is it just lack of understanding? Is it fear of maybe a technology that you don't understand? Is that this all? Of it? 
Yeah, I mean, so it's, it seems like there are some barriers to entry, but the good news is, is that when the internet started, there were all kinds of barriers to entry there too. And then you had all of these people entering the space and just creating all of these platforms that just made it so simple. You know, I don't know how my computer works, but I know that if I type something into Google, it's going to bring up all these nice search results. I know how that works. That's the good thing about, about Bitcoin, is that you have so many people in the space who are innovating right now, that it's giving so much power back to people. And also it's the, it's the power of financial privacy as well. And I think that we all deserve the right to financial privacy, but we just don't get it um, at the moment. Most of our transactions are digital. We're using cards most of the time. People don't carry around cash nearly as much anymore. But in order to use your card, the government has to go through, I, I mean, the government has enforced all of these laws, these know your customer laws that make you give so much information uh, to these banks. So they have all this kind of information so they can verify you are who you are and that person is who that person person is and then the transaction actually took pace and it's so expensive to do all this go through all this verification process and your information is just out there and you're just trusting the banks to protect it and are they doing a very good job no they're doing a really bad job because identity theft is a trillion dollar industry and people um, people's information is just being leaked all the time but the good thing about bitcoin is you could just start a bitcoin wallet and not give any information and the reason why you're able to make transactions why it's very Verified is because it's verified by math, not people. So that's really exciting. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time because I know that there are going to be uh, questions. I'm not sure how long I've been, been going for. But if you haven't looked into uh, Bitcoin, if you haven't looked into other alt currencies like Ether or Tezos or Zcash, these are all really exciting. And, uh, and I would encourage you to overcome your fear or maybe just watch some YouTube videos uh, explaining how to purchase it. And uh, just explore, even if you just spend $10 uh, on Bitcoin. Someone asked me last night, oh, I looked at the price, it's like $1,300. I don't have that much. The good thing about Bitcoin is it's infinitely divisible, so you could buy $10 worth. So I would say just have a play and uh, explore this new terrain because it is the future. We are in the middle of a financial revolution and blockchain technology is revolutionizing all kinds of industries. So I would, I would start exploring that because it's uh, very interesting. All right, thank you. Fantastic. Um, all right, we'll open this up to questions now. So I'm placing them through on the, the web app. Um, just while we're on this topic, I mean, um, not do we want to sell your children on the Bitcoin? We'll take um, <laughs> for a bit from Jack. Jack from Sydney, right? Um, for a Bitcoin beginner, what's the best Bitcoin wallet and where's the best place to buy it? Um, so the question varies depending on what country you're in. Um, in, in the States, I just encourage everyone to go to Coinbase because it's, you know, it, it's, the thing about Bitcoin is it's decentralized and you can have complete control of your money, but don't start there. It's better to use what is basically a Bitcoin bank like Coinbase or Australia that used to have CoinJar and have a third party provider look after your Bitcoin until you understand the security involved, which is fine at the moment. And so I encourage people to go through legitimate sites that have uh, credibility and have social confirmation of, 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 uh, of safety and, and all those kinds of things. Is, it, does, can anyone tell me, is Coinbase available in Australia? Coinjar. Coinjar, Coinjar is still open here? Coinbase is here. I, Coinbase is, is here, yeah. Okay, great. So that's the same in America. You can just link your bank account to your uh, Coinbase account, and I would do that. But there are also meetup groups. I was speaking to a gentleman yesterday who apparently runs a meetup group. If he wanted to, if he's here, he wants to leave a comment and the um, notes to let people know where that is. You can also do it face to face with people give you actual cash and you send them Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, I would I would look around in in Australia at uh, you know, maybe Coinbase would be an option there. If there are others, uh, just do some research into it first, look on Reddit and see what people are saying about it before you, you get involved. Um. Alright, um, so another issue that's come up here is, is the role of the precautionary principle. Am I the only one that can hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just see it. Yeah. You see it 
All right. Um, so, so one of the issues that's come up is, is the precautionary principle. And the precautionary principle is one of the sort of standard um, sticks that is used to beat back um, new technologies. Right? And, and particularly, the, the basic argument is, and uh, we were thinking, well, nuclear technology, here's a brand new technology. Let's start by imagining all the possible things that can go wrong, um, then legislate to stop all of those things that go wrong, and then we'll proceed with the technology. Right? And this, I mean, this is an argument that I think is, isn't shot down enough, um, because the whole sort of point of, of I mean, what's wrong with the precautionary principle argument, which is an absolute staple of the left. It's the standard sort of any new technology that comes along, um, this particularly in the case of medical technologies, um, especially, is, 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 is we want safety. Safety is a good thing. And we want to, to, to try and protect the children and make sure that nothing is harmed in this process. But this is sort of Hayek 101. This is knowledge problem. Right. It's very easy to imagine all the harms. You just make a list of all the things you don't like and are scared of, um, or all of the existing things that you like that might be threatened by it. Um, and what's really hard to do is to make the list of the benefits. So the precautionary principle is basically a way of stacking the deck of, of, for any new technology. And you know, this is the sort of key argument that often needs to be pushed back. And the only way to push back against this is to realize that we don't know what the benefits of most new technologies are, by definition. Um, most new technologies don't come with fully labeled that this one is for energy, and it will produce costless energy, and this one is to fix banking, and it will fix banking. Um, what comes along is a new technology, here's a new capability, we can now do this thing. Um, that's usually the easy part. The hard part is trying to figure out what the value of that new thing is. And I mean, what's interesting about AI and Bitcoin and blockchain right now is they're right in the middle of this. And you know, basically, we don't know what these are for yet. I mean, money is one use that was first discovered. Um, there's going to be thousands and hundreds of others. But if you think back, this is true of all technologies look like this. When the laser was first invented, it was basically about 20 years before anyone actually thought of something useful to do with it. Um, measuring things, um, storing data. Now it's, it's, it's like unimaginable to live in a world without this technology. All new technologies look like this. And I think this is the, the, the precautionary principle is the enemy uh, against, in, in, in this space. And this is the thing we need to, we need to be um, vigilant against. Does did you have any thoughts on that? I might use this one. Um, just in addition to that, and there's, there's many more examples except for those ones. Um, one of the other ones at the moment is drones that everyone's talking about. So they're, they're kind of on the scene at the moment. We're having a lot of national debates about how do we regulate this new technology. And it's not entirely clear what we're going to do with drones. So I don't think it's enough to say to people that uh, just have faith and we will eventually work out what, what this is for and some people will get hurt and that's okay. Um, we have an answer to this. It's called the court system and a rule of law. That's how we should solve this problem. Um, and that's always forgotten. There's always this push to try and prevent all these harms before they happen, when you can actually rectify the harms after they happen. And what we know, and the basic principle, the precautionary principle, is that we tend to overweight those harms. So we have to hope that those harms end up being less in the future. Um, I've had many late night dinner conversations about are the skies going to be blacked out with drones? Um, and people seem to have this image um, and I tend to be more optimistic about what's going to happen. Um, so I think, I think it's key to say we do have another way to sort this out. We sort it out after the fact. Are there any other questions? No, I think you guys have it. All right. Um, so another question that's sort of floating around that's been asked a few times on, um, is around intellectual property. And again, this is one of these things that tends to polarise this community. Um, essentially those who see it very much as intellectual property emphasize the word property. It's a property right. We love property, strong property rights. How can you be against that? And then there's the other side of the community, probably equally half of the people in this room, who see it as monopoly. It's a government-granted monopoly, and we hate monopolies, and we must kill them every time we see them. And uh, this is a this is a this is sort of a complex and interesting issue to, to discuss on this. Um, Sinclair Davidson and I have been making a strong argument, or a new argument, about the nature of intellectual property, that it's basically a consequence of trade and exchange. And 
the nature of it is not a government granted rent to recoup the investment problem associated with, with the discovery of new technologies, but rather it's basically to deal with a stationary band, of, with, with a world where other things can steal your ideas and your trade. And the key part of the story that we've been creating is, is that it's not teenagers in bedrooms downloading music and, and stealing things from, um, from producers. It's, it's, it's not other companies um, waiting for you to do the investment and then sending in their um, um, spies to, to copy your, your widget. Um, the main predators on intellectual property that is created through trade is usually other governments. And the classic example of this is um, in the health, is more or less pharmaceuticals or, or health, where you health care products, where you've got um, governments essentially permitting large scale theft or forcing price, forcing compulsory licensing of products and so on. So the reason you need your government to protect you is to protect you against other governments. Right? You, you see the issue here that. that Again, this is sort of complicated. I mean, intellectual property is a necess is necessary in a world where there are other large predators. Um, that. So, I mean, that's kind of one of the views that we've developed in this. I'm sort of from the camp that's anti-intellectual property rights. I believe you can't have property rights without scarcity, and there's no scarcity in ideas. Uh, I believe that competition in ideas you know, makes people create better products. Um, there is the argument that if you invest too, you know, so much money into something and um, you're not protected, someone else can come and steal your work, you waste all that investment, it, makes, give, it decreases the motivation for people to put that initial investment in. Um, I mean, that's just not the case. <laughs> I don't think that, that there's anything to back up that. Um, and again, like it just comes comes down to scarcity, in, in, in my opinion. Like you can't you can't protect something. I mean, we, you also have to look at the unintended consequences as well. So yeah, there may be cases where someone should have been protected and bad things happened because they weren't. But what we have in the the reverse of that is, uh, especially in America, it's just filled with patent trolls. And all they do is they just you know to put a very vague patent out there that covers all kinds of bases, and then they just hire a shit ton of lawyers to just search, scour for anyone creating a product that has any similarity to, uh, to what they've patented and uh, what it creates is a lack of innovation. So we've actually flipped it and rather than incentivizing people to invest and, and grow innovation and, and explore, we've actually incentivized people to put a hold on innovation. People, the, a lot of the companies who are, who are patenting these products are not innovating, they're sitting on their patents because they want to collect because the government's protecting them and I just don't think that's the future of innovation. Um, I just want to I just want to add to this that um, for some reason, if we see any other sort of government granted privilege, if we take occupational licensing, for instance, um, libertarians and classically liberal classical liberals straight away start thinking, oh well, there's a there's a big political economy aspect there. The problem there is that it's not going to stay at the level that we initially started it at. Um, the incumbent, the people on the inside, are going to lobby to extend it, and but we just don't see that in intellectual property. Um, intellectual property, patents for instance, it's a one-size-fits-all system. You, you get 20 years, it doesn't, it doesn't matter um, if it's a supposedly not very valuable invention or a very valuable one. Um, it's a one-size-fits-all system. Uh, if we accepted the argument that you, um, we do need property um, for individuals to recoup their costs of invention, um, there would be a different length of intellectual property for every single invention we know that that's going to come up straight against the knowledge problem, that's not possible, so what we end up is 20 years for everything. Um, now, patents are on an invention, they're not on an innovation. And this is what Joseph Schumpeter said to us, is that invention is creating a new technology like a pen, and innovation is finding out what we do with pens. Um, patents work specifically on the invention aspect, and they actually hold back the entrepreneurial aspect of working out what we do with it. I mean, that, that's the whole reason why 3D printing is just taking off in the past five years is because all of the patents started expiring. This technology's been around for a really long time and no one's been able to use it. So now suddenly we have, you know, um, uh, 
we have manufacturing at the consumer level, we have customizable products, we have prosthetics that where the price point has just gone down so much, people can suddenly afford all of these treatments because they have access to 3D printing. Um, I mean, that, that's something that we didn't have when this technology was first invented because there were just so many patents protecting people from exploring this product. Yeah, just one further um, point on this is, is it, it's often, it's often thought that a lot of innovation and new technology comes out of laboratories and that this is a sort of model of a scientist working at a bench and, 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 and in secret and then the patent protected and out it goes into the world and, and, and off we go. Um, lots of, arguably most technologies and innovations actually happen on a very different model and it's, it's more or less um, a civil society association model where one person develops one idea, shares it with someone else who sees some other additional way to fix that and then reuse it, reuses what they've got and passes it on to someone else. And this is you know, more or less the open innovation model. But that's how we got software. That's, um, that's more or less how we got one of the, the basic infrastructure of the modern world, was this kind of um, community of associations of people working together, freely sh sharing things. Um, the economics of it was kind of a reputational economy where people would grant prestige to those that, that performed well and, and, you know, and eventually firms got started out of that process. But that process was in part about discovering value, it was about pooling and reusing and you know, cooperating under civil society institutions to create new technologies. And it's often, I think just the point I wanted to make here is um, that's normal. That's, that's how most technologies have developed. The, when we focus on sort of a handful of um, things that are coming out of laboratories, as if that is the normal way that technology develops, we can, and, and, and therefore needs very strong IP protection, we often get very misled about the nature of technological change and innovation. Um, so, that. Um, the other question that's, that's arisen a few times here is around AI. So, I'm going to throw this to Brendan. Um, two questions, one from, from Dom, who asks if it's morally acceptable to enslave AIs and whether that's a violation of the non-aggression principle. Um, you know, you're, going to, you're going to address this. But the, and the other question um, around this theme is whether universal basic income is actually a solution to these, to these problems. Yeah, okay. Um... On the first question, but it's, it's funny because it's, it's not entirely unrelated to uh, the proposal recently that you should tax AI, right? So, um, and, and to me, it, it just, it's a category mistake. You can't really enslave something that isn't a conscious being. So, all these questions around artificial intelligence, to me, really come back to this question of consciousness. And uh, Gabe was sort of talking about this yesterday, that the non-aggression principle really exists from a consequentialist perspective anyway, which is backed up by the deontology. We don't want to get too technical here. It really, the question is whether this thing can feel. Because the non-aggression principle that, that, that you should be free of slavery exists so that we can have a good quality of life. Aristotle called this human flourishing, right? Uh, we want conscious beings to flourish. That's why we leave them alone, because we don't have all the answers about what constitutes human flourishing. So to me, um, it really comes back to, do you believe? And there are people who do believe artificial intelligence has consciousness. Um, the Shintos believe this pencil has consciousness, so I really shouldn't be writing with it. But um, it comes back to, do you believe uh, artificial intelligence is conscious? Then we're going into a question of, okay, uh, where do we draw the line about enslavement? But uh, if you don't believe it's conscious, I don't really think it's a question that arises there. So it comes back to that. Now, the other um, point about, the other question about universal basic income, look, I get nervous about universal basic income because it's, it's addressing the symptom, not the cause. Right? It's addressing the symptom, not the cause. Uh, and the, 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 the problem with artificial intelligence is basically just we don't, we, we can't, uh, we might not have anything valuable to trade. Right? And that's uh, the root problem that needs to be addressed. Universal basic income is slapping a band-aid on the problem. You know? um, 
and it, it has to be funded by taxation or if John has his way by friendly societies and I think that's actually something that we should definitely think about going forward. I can't see a world in which a universal basic income or some variant like a negative income tax or a um, uh, Bruce Chapman were here, uh, he'd say income contingent loans, or some variant of a redistributive system. I can't not see that being there, but I think that it's very much a stopgap. It's, it's not addressing the root cause of artificial intelligence, which is we want to be able to obtain an income off our own bat. You know, if you have uh, a universal basic income, you are still subject to the, co you are potentially subject to the coercion of the people who are paying you that income. So I think there's a role for it, um, but it is just addressing that symptom. It is not addressing the cause. If we want to address the cause, then we've got to get serious about how do we equip people to live and take control of their own lives, to live the lives they want in an AI world, free of all coercion. All right, we're getting the wind up, so we'll just end with some final thoughts or comments. Naomi, did you have any? Well, um, may, I'll just plug my children's book, Billy's Bitcoin. Uh, no, I mean, tech is, is um, exciting, and I, I agree with everything that you two were saying, that we just have to be really careful not to eliminate these safe harbors that have led to so much flourishing in tech. I mean, you have to allow people the space to innovate, and, um, and this is something that we need to fight for, because this is the future. So just, yeah, keep fighting that battle. Uh, I would say, um, you know, uh, with the precautionary principle, something that I would like to, to see more of is just not being afraid of technology. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing. And frankly, life is just more fun, <laughs> keeping ahead of the curve, right? It, it, uh, as technology progresses, it's, I, I used to not like technology, but it, it's, it's much more fun to keep up with it. It creates a better quality of life, learning all the time about this new technology and learning new ways to apply it. And variety is the spice of life. Variety is, let's work out something cool that we can do with Bitcoin. Let's, let's work out something cool that we can do with artificial intelligence. So that, uh, that idea, I would encourage you all to just stop being afraid of technology so much. There are bad things that, that can happen, but even then, it's, it's more fun to be up to date, to be learning about it and thinking about new ways that it can be applied. I'm not going to take up too much time. Um, I just think we should reclaim the entrepreneur when we talk about economics. Um, if we can bring economic policy back to the entrepreneur, I think we'll be in a, mu a much better place instead of talking about redistribution. Um, because it's a thing that we should all be in favour of. We should be extremely optimistic about it. Um, in, in Austrian economics, it's, it's the heart of the economic system, the entrepreneur, um, and we should reclaim the word. Yeah, so just, I mean, the, the point I wanted to make here is, is just that new technologies do not come labelled. We never know what they're actually for when we first get them. And the main mistake that we can make is to presume we know what this technology is for and then build regulatory boxes around it to protect ourselves from all the other things. And, I mean, that's the, that's the essence of, of, I think, what good classical liberal technology and innovation policy should look like, is, is permissionless innovation.